My name is James R. Hamilton. I'm the Minister of Fall Reformed Evangelical Chapel here in North Staffordshire in the United Kingdom. We're doing the Heidelberg Catechism and we're on Lord's Day number 12. The names of, well the name is Jesus and his title is Christ. Some people think wrongly that Jesus is his first name and Christ is his surname. Not so. His name is Jesus and his title is Christ. In Greek it is Christ, in Hebrew it is Messiah, and in English Anointed One. All, of course, mean that Jesus Christ, that the Son of God, is an office bearer. Jesus was ordained by his Father, designated by his Father, appointed by his Father to be an office bearer. And he was anointed by the Holy Spirit at the time of his baptism in the Jordan River, qualifying him with the power, the authority to fulfill his mission, to fulfill in his human nature those offices to fulfill his role as an office bearer in the kingdom of God. Those offices we find in the Old Testament dispensation, prophets, priests and kings. Those offices in the Old Testament were mere shadows. The prophet, priest or king was anointed with oil as a symbol of the Holy Spirit, whereas Jesus himself, the true office bearer, was anointed with the Holy Spirit himself. Man, originally created in the image of God, included those three offices. Adam, in his original state, pristine condition, was a prophet, priest, and king. He was, he had a true knowledge of God, he had a love for God, and he lived for God and for his glory. He was a prophet, true knowledge of God. He loved God, his priestly function, and he lived for God and for his glory. He ruled over God's creation, over the entire cosmos. This was the image of God in Adam, a prophet, priest and king. The knowledge of God, devotion to God and rule over God's creation. So, Lord's Day number 12, Heidelberg Catechism, question 31. Why is he called Christ, that is, anointed? Answer, because he is ordained of God the Father, and anointed with the Holy Spirit to be our chief prophet and teacher who has fully revealed to us the secret counsel and will of God concerning our redemption and our only high priest who by the one sacrifice of his body has redeemed us and makes continual intercession for us with the Father and our eternal King who governs us by his word and spirit, and defends and preserves us in the salvation obtained for us. So, point number one, the offices of Christ. No surprise to us at all that Jesus has these three offices. He is the whole, true and undamaged man in his human nature. And he fulfills those offices of prophet, priest and king, not just as a mere man, but as our mediator, the only mediator between God and men, substituting his substitutionary sacrifice, reconciling us, healing that alienation between us and God, reconciling us and restoring us to God's favour. 
The emphasis is on reconciliation. Here in the Catechism, our redemption. Because we have lost those offices that Adam, that Adam had when he was first created. As a prophet, priest and king of God in the Garden of Eden, when he sinned, man lost those offices. Jesus Christ comes and he restores those offices to us. The offices of Christ as a prophet. He is our spokesman, our chief spokesman, the Catechism tells us. He is our teacher. He reveals to us the secret counsel of God, that of course, which would be unknown to us had he not revealed it to us. The will of God, our redemption, that is. He comes to us and he reveals to us the secret counsel of God and the will of God concerning our redemption. God's counsel is his decree to save his elect, those whom he has chosen from before the foundation of the world. And of course, his will is the execution of that decree to save his people from their sins. But all this would have been remained concealed, secret, unknown, if Jesus, the arch revealer, had not come and revealed these things to us, communicated them to him. Much is yet unknown. There are many questions that we have concerning things that have not yet been revealed to us. How many are chosen to salvation, for instance? There are many, many questions we have, things that we do not know yet, that have not been revealed to us yet. But this is known, a redemption through Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, our prophet, our chief spokesman and teacher who reveals these things to us. As our priest, one thing for somebody to be able to point the way, the way to God, the way to salvation, but if that person cannot pave the way, what use would it be? Some person, some man can perhaps point you the way, give you directions towards a certain point, but if he cannot pave the way, if he cannot take you there, then what use is he to you? Jesus Christ is anointed to be our one and only priest, our great high priest, because of his one and only sufficient sacrifice, an unrepeatable sacrifice for our sins. He paid the debt that we could never, never pay ourselves. He cleared it, that debt of love that we owed to God. Jesus Christ, by his one and only sufficient sacrifice on Calvary's cross, opened the way up into the presence of God. So he not only teaches us the way, he not only points us to the way, he is the way. And that's what he means in John chapter 14 and verse 6 when he says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. The emphasis is on am. I am the way. Yet, he is active, he receives, he purifies, and he presents the prayers of God's people, and he enables those prayers because of his continuing priestly function, his intercessions at the right hand of God, and causes 
our imperfect and sometimes maybe even selfish, even sinful prayers to reach the throne of God, to reach his Father and presents them to him perfectly. But they come to God via him through Christ, our great High Priest. Jesus Christ is our King. Earthly kings die. You read of the kings in the Old Testament, one after another. So and so began to reign, and then he died. So and so began to reign, one after the other. But each and every one of them, they all died, but not Christ. Christ is our eternal King, everlasting King. He endures forever. His reign is never ending. His kingdom is a unique kingdom. You cannot point to it. You cannot say it is up there. It is to the left, to the right. It's down there. You cannot point to it. Where is it? It is to be found where Christians live. In the church. There, Jesus Christ. There is his kingdom. There he rules. There he governs. No. He has no army, and yet his church is an army. It is his militant church. It has weapons, but its weapons are not carnal, not guns and bullets, bombs and missiles. No, the weapons of his army's warfare are not carnal, but spiritual. He rules Amongst his people, he rules by his word and by his spirit. He governs. He's Lord of all. He's the sovereign cosmic Christ. He is enthroned on high. He is Lord of all. Philippians 2 verse 11, Jesus Christ is Lord of the universe, of the world, and of the church. Of all history, nothing, absolutely nothing happens in all this universe except by the will of Jesus Christ. He rules, he governs, he defends and he preserves his church. Now we're not told that it will always flourish as perhaps we have seen it flourishing in days past. We are told, in fact, in the world we shall have tribulation, but we are to be of good cheer because he has overcome the world. Our, ki our king, whose kingdom we are building. Are we? Building his kingdom? His own kingdom? Or are we building our own little kingdom? Question 32. But why are you called a Christian? Answer, because I am a member of Christ by faith, and thus a partaker of his anointing, that I may confess his name, present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him, and with a free and good conscience fight against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. Our second point, the office of believers. Because of Jesus Christ, because he is the anointed one, Christians, Christ and Christians belong together, the vine and the branches, John chapter 15. We are united, we are the branches, Christians, and we are united to Jesus Christ. Christ was anointed, and so we are too, we share, we draw from his anointing to be prophets, priests, and kings. 1 Peter 2 verse 9, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, 
a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. He brings, he brings us to be office bearers, believers in the Lord Jesus Christ are restored to that which Adam originally knew. So to be a Christian is not just simply to say, well, I'm not a Muslim, I'm not a Jew, I'm not a heathen, not even just simply to say I'm a member of the church. That's not enough. I'm a member as a Christian. I'm a member of Christ. We are restored to that place of being office bearers. And of course by grace. It is all of grace from beginning to end. Sovereign free grace to confess his name, to present ourselves as living sacrifices to him, and then afterwards to reign with him with Christ. Prophet, you see, to confess his name. Priest, to present ourselves as living sacrifices. Kings, afterwards to reign with him. In him, in Christ, we are all office bearers. That means to serve and to minister in his kingdom. It's not an arbitrary matter. It's not a hobby. It's not a pastime. We are obliged and yet at the same time privileged to be office bearers in the kingdom of God because we share in Christ's anointing. So we are called. Every Christian is called to minister. No, not spiritual retirees or the unemployed, but the ministry of believers is primary for every member of the kingdom of God. This goes back to creation, to Adam, and to the image of God, as I've already said. Created in the image of God with a true knowledge of God, devotion to God, to rule for God. The official ministry of the church, of course, which is very important, the instituted ministry, that is but temporary. That will pass away. But we shall ever and always be, even in heaven, we shall be prophets, priests and kings unto him. Revelation 1 and verse 6 And hath made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. To him be glory and dominion for ever and ever. Amen. You see, the Roman Catholic hierarchical system destroys and elim eliminates this altogether. All the power, all the authority, all ministry is given to the clergy and their lay people are just there as pulpit fodder. Ministry and ministers are given to the church but not to override the priesthood of all believers. We are called, every one of us, to minister, to be office bearers in the kingdom and in the church of God. Prophets, priests and kings. And so there is both passivity and activity in this. The words here in the confession, the catechism, they rather confess, sacrifice, fight, reign, are all filled with tension and with action. But we can do nothing, absolutely nothing, until we receive, until we receive from Christ. If we have not received Christ himself, then we can do, we can do nothing to serve, to minister. But by faith, when we have believed on Christ, we receive 
of his anointing. By faith we become members of Christ. We are united to Christ by faith. The branches must absorb the sap from the trunk, or rather from the root. Christ is the root, and from him we draw the sap. If the branches do not absorb the sap from the root, then there is no fruit. So if we are not united by faith to Jesus Christ, we will never, never bear any fruit. We have two hands as believers, as Christians. One is given to receive and the other is given to give. Again, question 32, but why are you called a Christian? Answer, because I am a member of Christ by faith, and thus a partaker of his anointing, that I may do what? Confess his name, present myself a living sacrifice of thankfulness to him, and with a free and good conscience fight against sin and the devil in this life, and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. You see, prophet, priest and king, confess his name, present myself a living sacrifice and hereafter reign with him eternally over all creatures. So thirdly and finally, the offices of believers. Normally, we think only of church officers ministers, elders, deacons, professors, as having an office. Well, um, the church, um, the church is very soon, very quick um, to tell um, our church officers if, well, if they're not performing as they should be. So often the church is like a bunch of people on a train and heading towards heaven and they're snuggled up with a book that if that train's not running right, if the guards aren't doing their job, if the engineers are failing, then, well, we'll be soon to tell them just that very thing. But, you see, we're not snuggled up, or we're not supposed to be snuggled up with a book on a train to heaven. We're all involved we are all office bearers and we are all supposed to be ministering and functioning. We must fulfill our functions in our threefold office as prophets, priests and kings. As prophet, confessing his name by deed and by word. Not just with our words, speaking about Jesus Christ to others, by showing by our actions what we do that Christ lives in us, that we share in his anointing. But of course, in order to do so, we need to hear his word. Because until we have heard his word, we cannot speak his word, we cannot confess his name, we cannot confess his word. Ezekiel 33 verse 7 says, so thou, O son of man, I have set thee a watchman unto the house of Israel, therefore thou shalt hear the word at my mouth and warn them from me. The prophet, you see, first of all, had to hear God's word at his mouth before he could speak to others. So again, there's passive and there's active. You will never be a prophet if you do not search the scriptures. You will never be a prophet if you do not make full use of the means of grace. Hearing God's word, learning God's word yourself. And of course, earnestly praying, listening to God, speaking with God. A zeal for his house and for his mission too. But then as a priest, living sacrifices, this is what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12 
and verses 1 and following. It's a reasonable service, he says. In the light of all that he said before, in those first 11 chapters of Romans, all that wonderful doctrine that he's laid out, therefore, he says, because of this, this is your reasonable service, to offer yourselves as living sacrifices unto God. A life of continual sacrifice, self-denial. I, I, is never first. It's the Lord first. It's an obligation, but it's voluntary. Intercession and blessing too. If you don't like a person's behaviour, if you don't like the way that a person's performing, have you prayed for them? Have you spoken to God for them on their behalf? Praying for the world, praying for the, your nation, praying for the community in which you live, praying for the church of which you're a member. A priest unto God, sharing in Christ's anointing. You're an office bearer. You're a priest in the kingdom of God. A king too. Ruling power begins here, now, in this life. The world. We are to rule over the world. The world's not to rule us. Faith overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith, says the Apostle John. The church. Is my, am I my brother's keeper? Well, the answer to that, of course, is yes. Ruling, reigning in the church. And then, of course, when life is done. We're told in Revelation 20 and verses 4 and following. And I saw thrones and they sat upon them and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God and which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So, are we the church militant still? So much fighting that is done between us within the church that is not good. That's not the good fight of faith. No, we are to rule. We are kings. We are office bearers in the kingdom of God. And we are to rule. But it begins surely by declaring war on our own sin, on our own flesh, ruling over the world, the flesh, sin, ruling over and subduing ourselves. Yes, there are anti-Christian powers outside, but alas, alas, there are a great number of spectators that we find in the church today. They seem to outweigh vastly the number of warriors. They take their seats in the stand and they sit there on the balconies filled, cheering them on, the warriors. But beloved in Christ, we should all of us be down there in the arena fighting. We must, we must behave like royalty. We're kings and queens. We are office bearers in the kingdom of God. We are prophets, priests and kings. We must behave like royalty. What would you think? What would you think of a five-star general in the army who went about behaving as though he were a buck private, cleaning out the, retreat, the latrines and doing menial tasks? You would say that's ridiculous nonsense and here you are a prophet priest and king 
you behave as such? Do you carry yourself as you were royalty? Yes, in the factory, in the print shop, in the garage, in the office, wherever you work. Yeah, even at the kitchen sink. Majesty, majesty ought to radiate from every Christian. He that has an ear to hear, let him listen. Amen. Amen.